Coming up on Tech Thing, we're gonna fight ransomware people. And uh, should you maybe start paying for antivirus, backing up DVDs and Blu-rays, pie hole and open DNS in one? Oh my goodness, it's all coming up on Tech Thing. Thank you patrons, without your support via patreon.com slash tech thing, Shannon and I wouldn't be able to make the show for you each and every week. Join the crew that makes Tech Thing possible at patreon.com slash tech thing. Thanks. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Patty Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we have something useful in every single show. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, oh my goodness. I have yet another reason why everyone should back up. Really? Right now. Why is that? Let's talk about ransomware, people. Oh boy. Okay, so the news starts trickling in. Ransomware attack, right? 18 plus hospitals shut down in the UK. Spain's Telefonica was apparently just whacked. They're telling everybody to shut down their machines, turn off the VPN, pull the power, run. Uh, Friday last week, it was in 99 countries, nearly 60,000 computers infected. By Saturday, the total was 237,000 computers in 150 countries. I'm talking about WannaCry. Whew. Nobody knows who launched it yet, uh, but we know that it uses the eternal blue exploit mm -hmm. from the Shadow Brokers NSA uh, dump by the Shadow Brokers. Uh, the, the, the stuff that the Shadow Broker says from the NSA, whatever right. you want to call it. <laughs> um, yeah, the WannaCry ransomware. I'm, I'm thinking of it as a ransom worm now. Because ransom I, worm. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. Uh, so basically what it does is it spreads itself via this thing called SMB protocol, which is the server message block protocol in Microsoft systems that Microsoft just happened to patch way back in March. But that doesn't really matter, though, because... I mean, we had a hospital in LA. They found that last year. Anybody can pretty much get spearfished. I mean, if you download the wrong, wrong file, <laughs> or if you get an email and you just decide to click mm -hmm. on the wrong link, or just get staggeringly unlucky if another zero day exploit gets dropped. I mean, ransomware happens, and it happens yeah. to anybody, especially infrastructure. It's, it's scary. It's scary. Ransomware is not going away anytime soon. So let's talk about how you can fight it. Yes. Right? Um, <laughs> basically, it's like, what can I do to prevent ransomware? I can get lucky, and I can increase the odds of being lucky, or best of all, I can just not care if my machine gets uh, uh, encrypted by ransomware, right. because I have backups! 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 Uh, <laughs> we, we talk about backups a lot. Three, two, one. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely, definitely, definitely make sure one of your local copies is not attached to your machine. Right. You know, if your data is safe, you can, you, well, I would make another gesture other than thumbing my nose um, <laughs> at the ransom notice. Uh, but you can basically be like, <clears throat> okay, they encrypted my machine, kill it with fire, and reinstall everything. Yeah. A tremendous pain in the ass. Nobody wants to spend a couple days of their life going like, okay, I'm downloading 74,000 Windows 10 updates. Now I'm reinstalling all of my apps. <laughs> now I'm backing my data off the cloud. But at least if you had yeah. that backup, that local one separated right. in an air-gapped, I don't know, hard disk drive or something, then you have that backup and you don't have to worry about paying somebody a few hundred bucks in a Bitcoin yeah. to be able to get it back. If you can even get it back. But yeah. we'll talk about that in a second. Look, if there, look at your computer right now. Have your husband look at their computer, your wife, your kids, and sit down and think like, what would break my heart or kill my business if it was lost off this machine? Yeah. And if you come up with a list of things, you need to get those, like, go buy a thumb drive. Like, it's two in the morning, there's a Walgreens or a Walmart <laughs> open near you. Run, don't walk, <laughs> get a USB thumb drive and copy that over. Um, what else can people do? Okay, so back up, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, trust no one. Yes. Avoid links in email. Uh, avoid unknown files. Don't download from shady places. <laughs> um, emails, especially if you are a business, if you know hospitals were a big thing, spear phishing, targeted. Like if somebody sends you, you know, Shannon wanted to talk to you about that project. <laughs> Even if it appears Who to be from me, yeah, because hackers are sophisticated enough at this point to fake email from people you are expecting to have email Spoofing. from yeah. to put things in there that you will click on and then ruin your life. Yep, email spoofing, um, DNS spoofing, yeah, those are things. <laughs> those are things, they're scary things. And what's really trippy is we know how we, we know how WannaCry propagates, we don't really know how they get it started. Mm -hmm. Although yeah. I like to think it was an accidental leak and they encrypted all of their own personal systems by accident before those started. <laughs> 
hacking systems out on the network. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> um, if you're not running any malware or any virus, it might be a good time to invest in one that does some active monitoring. Uh, it's kind of crazy. Um, not that this would be my first choice, but Malwarebytes has actually been running an anti-ransomware beta since like last April. That's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I bet that project is going to get kicked up in steam. But yeah, a lot of the major antivirus applications as of the security notices back in March, we're on the lookout for mm -hmm. this stuff. Yeah. Speaking of stuff, automatic updates. Yes. On everything, your operating system, your browsers, your antivirus, if you run any malware. Um, this flaw was fixed by patches in March. Yes. Corporations that update slowly uh, and use SMB are the ones that are getting whacked the hardest. And I understand, you know, You've got 3,000, you know, machines in a factory that don't need anything more than Windows XP. Absolutely. Except that all it takes is one person to get infected and then if they take out every machine on your factory floor. Yay worms! Yay worms! Yeah. <laughs> um, man, this flaw is so bad, Microsoft actually released an emergency patch for XP, Vista, Windows 8, um, Server 2003 and 2008. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. Yep. Um, and to make that very clear, Microsoft is no longer keeping those up to date. They're no right. longer sending out updates. So this was an emergency update that they just decided to yeah. put out there for those Microsoft operating systems. Oh my goodness. Um, so good on you guys, Microsoft. That was a really good choice to make. Back up your data. Yep. Trust nothing. Run AV antivirus. Make sure all your updates are turned on. That's pretty much all you can do. And be smart, you know, like we said, don't download weird applications from strange places. Yes. Don't trust links in email. Um, so one of the really big questions with encrypting ransomware is, should I pay for it? Should oh I pay boy. to actually get my data back? I mean, what if I don't have a backup? So there's a lot of security pros that really want you to not pay the ransom right. um, because if weasels can't make money hijacking your data, then obviously they won't take the time to try to do it in the first place. Mm -hmm. So if you don't pay them, they won't get any any money out of it. Right. That said, over the past few years, people have had success with paying ransoms to get their data back. Uh, apparently there is this honor among thieves type of idea when it comes to ransomware. Well, if you don't release people's data, then maybe the next time you want to <laughs> fleece them for money when you hijack yeah. their data, they won't pay you because you didn't give it to them the last time or somebody yeah. else didn't. So save yourself the headache and just back up before your drive dies or back up before your nephew manages to get your machine encrypted or I'm back up saying. before like, I don't know, some Somebody in your family decides to click on something they really shouldn't click on. In the case of WannaCry, right, which asks for $300, then it kicks the price up to $600 in three days right. and promises to erase your files in seven days. Um, you know, it's funny. The ransom hadn't turned up any keys that I'd heard of until actually I found uh, earlier today uh, Mikko Hipponen from uh, F-Secure says, we have confirmation that some of the 200 plus WannaCry victims who have paid the ransom have gotten their files back. Still uh, not recommended. Yeah. Um, and WannaCry's messy, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't create a unique ID or Bitcoin wallet for each individual infection. It literally requires a human to activate the decryption, like they have to manually send you a key via a Tor C2 login. Um, thanks to Hacker Fantastic on Twitter for that tidbit. Yes. So yeah. <laughs> If you've been hit, you might not want to pay the WannaCry ransom. And right. that said, the WannaCry ransom, um, I found this link off a, a lovely article. What's the WannaCry Bitcoin ransom trickle in on CNET? <laughs> um, and you can actually look at the history of transactions wow. for the uh, Bitcoin accounts listed. So they've got about 70 grand in there, give or take, <sighs> uh, as of Tuesday morning this week. This is a great resource everybody should be aware of, uh, nomoreransom.org. Security teams that are fighting ransomware and making free decryption tools. Um, Avast actually just joined the nomoreransom.org team. Cool. Uh, yeah, actually, it's pretty cool because one of the things they're doing is creating tools to decrypt uh, your data that has been ransomware encrypted. Mm -hmm. um, like we mentioned earlier, uh, you know, these guys don't want you to pay the security professionals for the most part don't want you to pay the ransom because no money equals no motivation for the crooks. So try these tools first and keep out uh, like keep 
just keep your ears up. And <laughs> yes. <laughs> if anybody out there in the audience has been hit by this, you have our deepest sympathies and our hope that somebody figures out a way to decrypt the data quickly and, and shares it all over the interwebs. And hey, yeah. if it's happened to you and you want to share the experience, do us a favor, ask at email. Ask at email. <laughs> <laughs> ask at techthing.com. And also, if you want more information on ransomwares in general mm -hmm. and WannaCry specifically, I did a really long episode about it for ThreatWire over on youtube.com yeah. slash hack5, which you can watch. It released on the same day of our recording today. Ransomware is not going away. No. WannaCry is not even going away. Like the kill switch there are new that versions. they've tripped on. Yeah, yeah there are new versions. So be careful, make sure your data is backed up, beware of ransomware is always update. Dan tweeted out, at Tech Thing, I'd like to back up my DVD collection to a NAS that can stream to my devices on my networks. Do you have any tips? Oh, oh, do we? Yes, <laughs> everyone should go out and buy a fresh digital copy from iTunes, Android, or the Google Store of DVDs or Blu-rays that you already own, because let's face it, it's easier. <laughs> it is easier. It is a lot easier to just rebuy movies. And there's a lot of sales on Google Play. Mm -hmm. So I'll usually, like, I just bought the entire Star Wars saga on Google Play for, like, I don't know, 40 bucks or something. It was awesome. It was I a great deal. It's glorious. Great deal. So anyway, DVDs yep. are pretty easy to back up. Uh, if you ever end up with Blu-rays, on the an other hand, those can be a little <laughs> bit harder. Yes. I have been trying to and parse bigger. down. Yeah. They're way bigger. I have been trying to parse down all of the items in my household. I'm trying this whole minimalist thing. And with that comes digitizing all of my data, including Blu-rays and DVDs. Now, first off, I would like to put in a disclaimer. Make sure you're allowed to make digital backups of your data before you do it, depending on your country's laws. There's a whole bunch of information over on Wikipedia with links provided to those <laughs> copyright laws as well. So for example, US copyright law is Title 17 of the United States Code generally says that making a copy of an original work, if conducted without the consent of the copyright owner, is infringement. The law makes no explicit grant or denial of a right uh, to make a personal use copy of another's copyrighted content on one's own digital media or devices. So for example, space shifting by making a copy of a personally owned audio audio CD for transfer to an MP3 player for that person's personal use is not explicitly allowed or forbidden. Even the RIAA says like, technically this isn't legal. No, technically this isn't illegal, but technically it's not legal. So just don't share them online or yeah. try to sell them and we won't send our <laughs> hot shark attack lawyer. Existing. After you. Exactly. So existing copyright statutes may apply to specific acts of personal copying as determined in cases in the civil or criminal court systems, building up a body of case law. So consumer copyright infringement cases in this area to date have only focused on issues related to consumer rights and the act applicability of the law of sharing of ripped files, not the act of ripping per se. So yeah. like Patrick mentioned, don't be selling those, okay? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it's been really funny to watch over the years because no one's ever, no one on the studio slash encrypted things side wants the DMCA to go to the Supreme Court and get overturned. But basically that's because the 1998's Digital Millennium Copyright Act says you can't circumvent digital rights management, i.e. the encryption on a DVD or a Blu-ray, right. and other technical protection measures, <laughs> uh, even for fair use. Uh, but that's here in the US, and frankly, if you're not sharing the videos on the internet, you're probably not going to get noticed. Right. Yeah. Don't be selling them. Don't be making copies for your friends, yo. Personal Please. use. Please. Okay, so for ripping DVDs and Blu-rays, I've been using this program called Make MKV, which you can find over at makemkv.com. It is free while it's in beta. Apparently it's been in beta for years. Yeah. Eventually it will cost $50, and it's available for Windows and Mac. So for example, I couldn't use this on my Linux PC like this one without Wine. Nevertheless, I decided to download this on my home PC where I have a Blu-ray player already installed. It handles newer copyrighted uh, protected Blu-rays quite well, which mm. I have heard, which is its main perk. Now, cons of this, again, cost 50 bucks eventually, and it does take an hour or two to rip a Blu-ray depending on how long the video file is. So it's gonna yeah. take about as long as the actual video is. So if you have a three hour movie, it'll probably take you three hours to actually rip that Blu-ray. Also, the output file is gonna be really big <laughs> like 20 or 30 gigs for a movie That's as why an the example video looks so glorious off it of looks so good yeah 
amazing, amazing quality. Mm -hmm. So to actually use this, and I took photos because, of course, I don't have a Blu-ray player on this machine right here, but I took photos for you. All you have to do is open MKV and then insert your disc, and this will fire up a little uh, digital disc that will move around. Uh, once it is done, once it loads, you just click on the big icon, which will look like a Blu-ray or a DVD right there, and then it will start loading up the digital file. So this is going to read the disc and then load up any and all video files, whether that is just one big movie file or several bonuses and extras. So you'll see here that it is currently loading up this video file of this Blu-ray disc, and then once it is loaded, you can click on whichever files that you want to back up and which ones you want to ignore. So some Blu-rays, like this one for example, have tons and tons of subtitles, which you can choose to keep or you can discard them just by clicking the little check mark in the little boxes. This does take a bit of time, but you will be very happy if you don't have to go <laughs> through all those subtitles, if you just want English, for example. Now after choosing all those files, all you have to do is click click that big Make MKV button, and then it will start burning your disk onto an output file for backup. Now you can customize destination and name, so if you want to switch this to an external hard disk drive or you have a like 4 terabyte backup drive like I do for example, mm -hmm. you can always stick it on there instead of your normal C drive, which is really nice. Movies do keep their tra chapters, which you can also see in like a player like VLC, and I believe nice. Plex also carries those over too, so that's very, very useful. Now once all of that is done, you want to pull up this thing called Handbrake. Now, Handbrake is available over at handbrake.fr. Uh, keep in mind now, handbrake. yeah, Handbrake is awesome. It's what we use to actually convert our video files for our podcast uh, feed, so our RSS feed. So with Handbrake, because the outputted MKV file is absolutely huge, it's way too big for mobile phones. So we want to convert it to something smaller. So you can do that by turning it into an MP4. Now, if your file, or if you have a whole library of files, it doesn't take long to fill up one terabyte hard disk drive. So this can be really handy because an MP4, instead of being 20 or 30 gigs, it'll be 3 or 4 gigs. Mm -hmm. So it'll Which save you a lot of space. Which looks fine on a 3-inch screen. You it does. You just don't want a, you know, yeah. one gigabyte three-hour movie yeah. on your big screen. Uh, normally these will output to like a 1080p 30 FPS video file, so it still looks really, really good. It's full uh, high resolution, so mm -hmm. you'll be good. Uh, H.264 MP4s are generally accepted by most devices, so it's the best option that you want to use in Handbrake. That way you can play it across iPads and iPhones and Android devices and your Roku and wherever else you might want to store it. Now you will lose a bit of quality, obviously, because you are converting it, it to a smaller file, so keep the original if you want to. If you use Plex, there is no need to convert files to MP4 unless you are saving sp space because Plex, turns out, will actually run MKV files too, which I didn't know until I started playing with it. Imagine that. So cool. Plex is amazing. So, <laughs> yes, and so is Handbrake. So if you downloaded this uh, Handbrake that is in early May, I want to make sure everybody knows about this. Uh, apparently there was a little problem with some of the mirrors of Handbrake downloads. They were compromised and they had malware infected on them. They are fixed now, so if you ha had downloaded Handbrake in early May, you probably want to uninstall it. Make sure you don't have malware and then reinstall it since <laughs> it's now fixed. Uh, but once you have that, taken care of, you should be fine. Okay, so now back to Handbrake. Open Handbrake, click on your source, which is this nice little open source button right here, and that is going to allow you to find your source file, so mine is this Title II, which is a, almost 20 gigs in size, so it's a pretty big file, and you'll nice, have this nice little source selection option, so that's where you choose your file and then open it up in Handbrake. So this is going to give you an option to set up a destination then. So choose Browse under Destination, and then that will allow you to choose a destination for your new MP4, and then you can name your file. So for example, I put mine in my E drive under Videos, and then named my file .mp4, whatever it ends up being. Once you have your destination chosen, you should see a source of 1920 by 1080 down here. Everything looks good. So you choose MP4 under the output and then click Start. 
Yay. Now, I did want to mention as well, if you need to add subtitles for a video file, it is a little bit more complicated. Uh, there is a walkthrough that's available over on opinionated.com, <laughs> of all places. Uh, but this allows you to understand the burning of subtitles and whether those are hard-coded or soft-coded, and if you can have the option of turning them on or off. So uh, read through that if you want to add subtitles, because it does get a little bit it's a little bit harder to do that. I'd also say it's fun to play around with the presets that are, because Handbrake finally hit version 1.0 after oh, yeah. what seems like forever <laughs> of waiting, and they have a tremendous number of presets on the right side of so uh, cool. Handbrake, so you can basically experiment with different things and do that, just try three or four of them out before yeah. you burn like 250 movies. Yes, yeah, make I'm sure they saying. actually work. <laughs> make sure they actually work. Uh, so once everything is set up, and here you do have a subtitles option right there, you can go on to burning, and you will see at the very end of your conversion process from MKV to MP4, it should say Q finished right down here at the bottom, and then you can actually test that video file, and just like Patrick mentioned, definitely test your file. <laughs> now you can store all of your new movie files on your NAS for streaming, but what NAS do you have? Now if you have a Synology, <laughs> don't laugh at me, <laughs> if you have a Synology, they do have this thing called Video Station, which is available on many of their Synology devices, almost all of them. I have reviewed these in the past, so you have seen me use the uh, video station on my smartphone, for example, and it does work quite well for streaming, uh, highly suggest. Now, if you don't want to use a video station, you can also use something like Plex, and we have also talked about Plex a little bit, though we ne have never done like a full-on review of Plex, but it does have a lot of features, automatically runs with mm -hmm. MKV or MP4s, and they have a free and a premium version. Uh, basically, you get everything in the free package except for stuff like parental controls, a DVR, uh, and so on and so forth. So I highly recommend Plex. It is really, really cool, and it works on things like Rokus and Xboxes and all the things. <laughs> Also remember, um, if you have a like a, a Windows machine on your network that's on twenty four seven, yeah, uh, open up the control panel, type in like media or media share, and this is in Windows ten. It's a little different in seven and eight. Go to media streaming options, and you can turn media streaming on oh, inside of Windows. Yes, and basically that's true. use your Windows box as a free media streaming machine. Yeah, it works too. And the last thing I wanted to mention was also QNAP, and those do support Plex as well, so you can check those out and all the details on how to set that up over on QNAP's blog. And lastly, if you have a different kind of NAS and you're not sure if yours, uh, yours is compatible with Plex or not, Plex actually wrote down this entire Google Doc of all these Whoa. different Synology and QNAP NASs and a ton of other brands that I've never even heard of, but now I want to <laughs> check out because they all work with Plex. So you have lots of options. Hopefully you own Some one that works with Plex. Some of those are very old, very slow, <laughs> and I assure you, you do not want to check them out. <laughs> <laughs> so now you have a nice overview of everything everything you need to know, know to get those DVDs and Blu-rays from MKV format all the way to MP4 so you can play them on your, all your mobile devices to your NAS if you want to play them on Plex or Video Station on your Synology. From disc Ooh. to streaming on your NAS. Ah, oh, it's so wonderful. Minimalism. I love it. What are your picks, people? Email askatechthing.com. If you got questions about streaming or encoding or media or Plex, fire them out. We are here waiting. When you're cocked towards the email. Waiting. Probably look at the email and not listen to it. Askatechthing.com, please. <laughs> Patreon.com slash techthing people, tech thing patrons. They can watch our build videos, subscribe to an audio only feed, check out videos of the edit of every show. And if you're a patron at the $10 level, you can join Shannon and I in our monthly hangout tomorrow, the day after the show goes live. Thank you for your patronage. You make the show possible. And hey, we understand if you can't donate, but if you got a question, curse, see us, review something, got a tip or an idea, please fire them out to askatechthing.com. Thank you so much for supporting us, no matter how you do it. Real quick, I wanted to remind everybody to hit that notification bell on youtube.com slash techthing. I usually hang out in the comments during the first like half an hour to an hour whenever Ooh. episodes post, so we can have conversations about the different segments, but you can only join in on that conversation if you are notified whenever new episodes are posted on YouTube, so definitely hit that bell. Now we got an email from Leonard. He writes in, 
Hey Patrick and Shannon, a couple of months ago I got a new laptop and I'm still not sure what to do with virus scanners. For the last couple of weeks I kept using the standard Windows Defender included in Windows 10 and as far as I can tell it does a great job for a free tool. I've included the Defender white paper. Even with the recent exploit, I still feel that Microsoft did a good job patching it as fast as they could. What do you guys think? Is Defender Plus a bit of common sense enough to keep your laptop virus free? Should I buy a more powerful tool like like Malwarebytes, Kaspersky, or Bitdefender. Thanks from Leonard. So Leonard notes that he's used a lot of free virus scanners over the years, like AVG, Avast, and Komodo. Um, you know, I gotta say, the big lesson this week is to back up your data and make sure that you update, especially at the office. Um, I run four Windows boxes. I run Bitdefender on my primary machine at home, and I'm about to install it on my office machine because I'm feeling a little skittish this week. <laughs> uh, I trust Windows Defender for the other two or three boxes that I'm running. And that said, given that I have a nine-year-old that's making his first forays onto the internet, I'm actually rather tempted suddenly to install more antivirus on his machine. So this kind of brings up something that I did recently. I did a, uh, a very InfoSec related question survey on Twitter where I asked InfoSec people, do you run antivirus uh, why, or, or not, basically? And 40% of the people that answered said no, they don't because they are elite. And the other 60% said yes, they do either antivirus or malware or mm. both together, which I found interesting. But most of the people that said no was either because they run Linux mm -hmm. or they are elite, or if they do run it, they just use Windows Defender. So. Sounds like you're on the right level with them. Well, you know. Windows Defender. Yeah, I mean, and for the most part, the vast majority of people I know, you know, who are technically sophisticated, like, yeah, I got Defender, I'm good. Um, <laughs> that said, if you're not feeling InfoSec professional bulletproof this week, and I can understand why you might not be, um, the nice thing about uh, antivirus prices is they can be really, really reasonable if you shop carefully online. For example, three of the top choices, uh, McAfee's Antivirus Plus, Symantec Norton, no relation to me, Antivirus Basic, and Bitdefender Antivirus Plus 2017 all cost $19.99 a year. It's a good if price. If you know where to look. And mm -hmm. for me, I found those prices by going to PCMag.com, the best antivirus protection of 2017. And if you click through their links, you will get the super awesome, super cheap pricing, which is like a third of what it normally sells for. Ah. So props to the crew at PCMag for making that happen. <laughs> Yeah, and if you're on the sort of, I won't pay for an antivirus, but I still want something better than Defender, Avast remains a very, very good free choice. That's what I've been using for quite a long time. That one or AVG. The only thing I will say is with the free ones, you get pop-ups all the time asking you to upgrade the premium. You know, we're doing a great job, but we could do a better job if you sent us money. <laughs> Which is fine, you yeah. know, it's free. <laughs> People like to eat yes. and have roofs over their heads. Just make sure you are backing up your data Please. and keep your updates on and disconnect your machine from the internet. What? What? Why not? Okay. Air gap your machine. Yep. Air gapping, <laughs> that's it. I'm out Just of here, people. Turn off the internet, go in the woods, <laughs> live by yourself. Never talk to another human being, ever. <laughs> mm, this sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Tony D writes, ask at techthing.com. You can use the pie hole and open DNS. The pie hole is just a DNS forwarder after comparing huh. queries to a whitelist or blacklist. So if you cho chose open DNS as your upstream DNS provider, as they call it, you can get the best of both worlds. Choosing a public DNS provider is one of the first steps whenever you initially configure the pie hole. Just thought other viewers may find this useful. Love the show. I've been watching since the beginning from Tony. Well, thank oh, you, He's Tony. a veteran. <laughs> Woo! He's a tech thing veteran. What? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's like the phrase of the week. What? <laughs> I'm not sure I actually said you couldn't use the two of them together. It just never occurred to me that somebody might actually want to run them together. But you've just made an excellent argument for why you might want to. Thank you for the tip, Tony. And hey, we love it when you share stuff with us. Askatechthing.com or you can tweet at Patrick Norton. At Snubs. We're or there. at Tech Thing. Or at Tech Thing. Mm -hmm. All three of us. They're all there. Waiting for you. 
some strange noises happening amongst us. So last off, I also wanted to mention, <laughs> we were in a warehouse. Strange things happen all the I time. I think there's another salt shaker battle going on. A salt shaker battle? Were you here for the salt shaker battle? Uh, no. It was epic. I didn't know there was Drones, one. Anyway, salt tangent. salt shakers, <laughs> howling children. So several viewers also pointed out that there was a class action lawsuit, or there still is, brewing around a flaw in my new ARIS 6190 modem. You can find a ton of details about this over at dslreports.com. I will link this in the show notes. So essentially, the suit claims that a flaw in the Intel Puma 6 chipset, chipset in the 6190 causes latency problems. Um, my friend Joel, who works at a company that makes products for, and they also hi, support, Joel. hi Joel, the, uh, the head end cable industry, he put it best. He said, I would like to point out to casual observers, all modems, not just the 6190 performance, are monitored for service reliability and robustness by the head and operator. In short, there is no such thing as a perfect network, and I would like to suggest the plaintiff's sample in regards to the Aris lawsuit. Data is limited to their service connections, which is a shared pipe with other users on the same cable node, and any empirical data they may have is likely flawed because they likely don't have an isolated nest network to test and prove their claims. From Joel. So if I do end up having latency issues on my own 6190, which I haven't so far, and we're going on four weeks now, mm -hmm. I will totally join that lawsuit because, I mean, who doesn't want to get paid if their stuff doesn't work right? Like and I will absolutely upgrade. I know, right? It'll probably just be like two bucks. <laughs> and I will totally upgrade, no doubt about it. But at the moment, it's been worth the money. So I'm a happy customer, but keep that heiress lawsuit in mind if you guys chose to buy the same one. <laughs> oh my goodness. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, once in a while, put down the phone, step away from the screen, close the laptop and do something analog like sit in a shiny silver tube for 18 hours while you fly to Australia. Keep going. While cradling the Nintendo Switch. Yes. <laughs> so you're going to be doing- I'm ready. A, you're doing a, a presentation at uh, Ossert. I am. With Darren. Yes. Darren your Kitchen. Pack five on. Darren Kitchen and I are giving a keynote at Ossert, which is happening at Gold Coast, Australia, at the Marriott Surfers Paradise, I believe it is. I think our keynote is on Thursday at like 9 a.m. or something, so I can't party the night before. But if you are there, I would love to meet you. I think it's going to be awesome. I have never been to Australia, too, so let me know what I can do while I'm down there. Drop um, I think Beer. I'm I'm going to visit some drop bears and eat some Vegemite, as long as I eat it right. Not like Darren, who apparently eats it wrong. <laughs> That's my plan. That's my analog plan. I'm going to eat some Vegemite and meet me some drop bears. I played rugby with an Australian. <laughs> Vegemite will never, nope, uh-uh, can't I will, do I'll it. I'll do it. I'll you do should it. try, everyone should try Vegemite at least once. I'm going to do it. You should. I think I tried it before, but it was so terrible. So I is there an official Australia hangout? And if there is going to be one, where should people look? Yes, there is going to be an official Australia Hack 5 slash tech thing meetup. You can find all the information at hackacrosstheplanet.com. I will put that link in the show notes as well. That's H-A-C-K, not H-A-K, like Hack 5. <laughs> hackacrosstheplanet.com. You can sign up and we will notify you as soon as we have a place where we can hang out with everybody. So yeah, definitely meet up if you guys are in Gold Coast, Australia or close by as well. It'll be like upside down in winter. <laughs> Do the toilets go backwards? Oh boy. <laughs> I don't even want to get into the Coriolis effect. I don't know. <laughs> We're going to go science after the show and learning about which direction the toilets spin at the southern hemisphere and why. But for now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Shannon Morse. We'll see you next week on Tech Thing. I have no clue. You know, I, I tried this theory when I went to Tahiti for my wedding, and I didn't remember which way toilets flush in America, so then I went to flush a toilet, and I was oh. like, I don't know if it's backwards or not. <laughs> Apparently, it's the Coriolis effect toilet myth. Oh, it's a myth! The truth about toilets and the Coriolis effect. Thank you, everyone. Do toilets really flush the opposite way in the Southern Hemisphere? Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm. I'm sciencing, but I really actually desperately appreciate the fact that y'all make tech thing possible. Does water drain in different directions in the different hemispheres? Just give me a big fat yes or no, not a long article. Well, it's a long discussion. TLDR. <laughs> oh, Smarter Every Day and Derek Muller from Vetus 
Varita serum went to great lengths to show it, very great lengths, literally opposite sides of the earth. <laughs> they set up identical pools, one in the US and one in Australia, and drained the water from them. They created two videos meant to be seen side by side. They have it set up and go to Smarter every day. This is crazy. That's so cute.